Are we living in the end times? There may have never been another time in history when end times prophecy has been more aligned with the culture and circumstances of the world than it is today. I believe there are 10 phenomena we are witnessing today that were recorded centuries ago in Bible prophecy. Seeing our circumstances in light of these prophecies should give us resolve, purpose, and hope. And help us answer the questions. What are we to do with the world around us? What hope do we have in times like these? And ultimately, where do we go from here? Would you be surprised to know the decay of character is a precursor for Christ's return? We can see it. The bad is getting worse. Godlessness is overtaking every square inch of our culture. Decency is crumbling, and the Bible predicts the rise of end times people. But just who are they? Join Dr. David Jeremiah for this special prophecy edition of Turning Point as he presents a sign of the end times. End Times People, a biographical prophecy. Sean Hopwood grew up in a Christian home in rural Nebraska, and he had parents who had started a local church. He was the oldest of five children, and he was bright and excelling on standardized tests. He also played basketball in high school and won a scholarship to Nebraska's Midland University. But in his teens, Hopwood grew disillusioned with his basketball skills. He stopped going to class, and he dropped out of school. Then he joined the United States Navy and ended up in the Persian Gulf guarding warships with shoulder-mounted Stinger missiles. But Hopwood developed acute pancreatitis, almost died in a Bahrain hospital, and he left the Navy with an honorable discharge. That's when lostness overtook this young man. His alcohol and drug use grew into raging addictions, and he became depressed. One day while drinking with a friend, they decided to rob a bank together. Why not? They could use the money. They ended up robbing five banks while armed. Afterward, Hopwood squandered the money on parties. And eventually his life came crashing down in the lobby of a Doubletree Hotel in Omaha, Nebraska, when FBI agents tackled and arrested him. A year later, he stood terrified before a federal judge who sentenced him to more than 12 years in prison. And shortly thereafter, he was on a prison plane, handcuffed, shackled, heading to a federal penitentiary. He was only 23 years old, and his life was growing worse and worse by the day. Now, if you stay with me, I'll tell you what happened to him at the end of my message. But his story raises questions for all of us. Why do people go the wrong way? Or in a broader sense, why do good people do bad things? According to Scripture, sin is the fundamental problem of every person. Romans 3.10 says, No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. That's from the New Living Translation. Our problem, then, isn't just that we live in a sinful world, which we do, but that we live in a world full of sinful people <laughs> because our sin affects everything in our lives. The Bible makes it clear that we are all corrupted by sin, every one of us. That corruption entered our bloodstream through Adam and Eve, who rebelled against God in his garden. And the blood disease of sin has descended through the generations, and it affects all of us today. The Bible says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin." Because we have been stained by sin in this way, every one of us, the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. We cannot produce anything good on our own. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. 
There's no other program that you can go to. God is the only one who can offset the impact of original sin, sin that started in the garden. So what that means is you and I live in this war zone we call planet Earth. We're pushed and pulled between goodness and evil, between love and hate, between creation and destruction. You and I are Christ followers in a fallen world. And that has been true for God's people throughout all the centuries. But can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing. The bad is getting worse. Godlessness is overtaking every institution, every platform, every square inch of our culture because something in us is broken. We live in a world of sinful people. Better said, we live in a world of broken people. And the brokenness is becoming everywhere more evident to us as time goes by. What does this mean? Well, I want to show you a prediction about the last days that will put all of this into prophetic context. I want to quote from a letter written by another prisoner, this one on death row. And he wasn't there for robbing banks. He was there for preaching the gospel. <laughs> the apostle Paul wrote his final letter to Timothy from a Roman cell. Near the end of his letter, he drew a surprisingly detailed picture of how people will behave just prior to the Lord's return and the beginning of the tribulation period. So I'm going to read that letter and see if you don't resonate with what he said. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then if you jump down in this passage to the 13th verse, here's what it says. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we're not just imagining this. What's happening right now isn't just something that, oh, I, I, I haven't known many evil people before, so maybe I'm just medium all right now. <laughs> no, the Bible says that there will be a trajectory toward the coming of Christ when sinful people will be more sinful, evil people will be more evil, and difficulty in relationships and all the rest will be more profound. You know, it's an interesting thing. Nobody knows how good a person can be. And nobody knows how bad a person can be. Paul gave us 19 specific character descriptions of what people will be like. In other words, here in 2 Timothy 3, the Lord gives us 19 expressions to depict the nature of godlessness in the last days, the things we should expect and not be surprised by. I can't bore into all the 19 words, and I'm not going to do a 19-word word study. But I can show you a pattern in Paul's words that move from selfish people to splintered families to shattered societies. First of all, selfish people. Right up front, the Lord tells us that the last days will be populated by people who are lovers of themselves. Narcissistic people. People who see themselves in the mirror and applaud. According to Paul, the days before the tribulation will be perilous because people will love only themselves. They will, according to the Scripture, be boasters and proud and blasphemers. These people love to talk about themselves and to build themselves up. Such people want everyone else to love them as much as they love themselves. They write their own press reports. They pad their own resumes. When you finally meet the person in question, you hardly recognize them. These are proud or haughty people, which means they're disdainful toward other people. Looking down on others comes as naturally to them as it does to a pigeon on top of a statue. Perhaps nothing represents this attitude better than social media. 
Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram allow us to constantly crow about our own success while simultaneously slashing away at the achievements of other people, often through anonymous comments and online bullying Social media is a stronghold for selfish people. Unfortunately, selfish people rarely keep to themselves. Well, selfish people end up being a part of splintered families. People will focus less on their loved ones. Their time, energy, and passion will be tied up in themselves. And the result was, in the days prior to the tribulation, will be strewn with broken homes. And he uses five descriptions these five descriptions highlight the damage that broken people perpetuate on their own families in the last days. It says they are disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, and unforgiving. Those are the five things that are in the text. And I want you to know that when ancient Greek writers wanted to say something negative, they took a positive word and put a letter in front of it called the alpha privative. The alpha negated the positive word. You see the principle in English when we say something is distasteful. We take the word tasteful and we put a prefix in front of it, and that prefix negates the word. All five of Paul's terms about the family included in the paragraph are alpha privatives. All five describe a positive attitude that has vanished from most families during the last days. Children will be disobedient willfully. They will do what they want to do, casting off oversight and authority. They will ignore the instruction of Scripture that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. They will be ungrateful. Gone will be a thankful spirit between children and their parents. And that lack of gratitude will extend to other relationships. The third word is unholy. In this context, that implies lack of respect. There will be no respect within the structure of the framework of the family. The picture is of someone who throws off the oversight at all levels of authority and harbors a growing sense of rebellion and independence. Next, we come to the word unloving. Normal human relationships will be destroyed and broken and affected and wither away. The word here is translated elsewhere in the New Testament as heartless. Homes will become hard places, ruined by harsh hearts, and it'll spill over into the whole society. And the final word is unforgiving, which could also mean truth breaker. This refers to people whose rebellion becomes stubborn and hard-hearted. The root of bitterness within them grows into an emotional forest of poisonous trees bearing toxic fruit. And the lack of capacity to forgive others means they live as though they themselves could never be forgiven for all the harm they've done. By now, you may be wondering, is this going to keep getting worse and worse? Is this going to be a whole negative sermon? No. Let's take a breath of fresh air. Let's take a moment and turn this around. If the ungodly world is characterized by these negatives, how should God's people live in the midst of it all? It's very simple. Our grammar has to change. We should leave off the alpha privative. In Christ, it's not appropriate to negate a virtue. <laughs> Our homes should be filled with obedience between children and parents. Families should be filled with gratitude and defined by respect. They should exude a natural love and affection, and we should be able to trust each other. We have to work hard to avoid the alpha privative lifestyle. You probably never heard that word before, but here's a new term. Don't be an alpha privative family. Don't be a family that negates all the virtues that you've been given by Almighty God. We must be doggedly committed to biblical marriages and kingdom families. Whatever has happened to you in the past, start where you are today, and with God's help, make your home a place that's indwelled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Make it a Christian home. So are you getting this picture? When you have selfish people, they end up creating splintered families. And splintered families create shattered societies. Now, I'm going to do something right now that I, I've fought with myself all week as to whether I should do this or not. So I'm not really sure whether I should do it, but I'm going to do it. So 
One of my favorite preachers is Tony Evans. I love Tony Evans. Believe it or not, when I, was a, when I graduated from seminary, I went back and I taught some postgraduate courses, and Tony Evans was in my class. My great, my great claim to fame was I was Tony Evans' teacher for one semester. <laughs> and so everything good about him, he learned from somebody else. If he's messing up, it's my fault. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Tony and his family have been friends of ours for so many years, and I love to hear this man preach because what an orator he is. When he goes off on one of his orations, he just spellbinds you. And I heard one in one of his messages recently that totally illustrates what I'm talking about. And I can't be Tony Evans, so don't get your expectations up. But I'm going to tell you what he said. Here's what he said. If you're a messed up man and you have a family, you're going to help make a messed up family. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family and your messed up family goes to church, then your messed up family is going to make its contribution to a messed up church. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood, and your neighborhood's part of a city, well, you messed up neighborhood is going to make its contribution to a messed up city. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city that's part of a messed up county, and your county is part of the state, well, your messed up county is going to make its contribution to a messed up state. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city that's part of a messed up county, contribute it to a messed up state, and your state's part of the country, well, guess what? Your messed up state's going to make its contribution to your messed up nation. And if you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city that's part of a messed up county that's contributing to a messed up state, your messed up country is going to make its contribution to a messed up world. So, do you get that? I wish I could do it like him, but I can't. But I love the way he does it and love most of all his point. It starts with individuals, doesn't it? We look around, we say, oh, this, my church is a mess. Well, you probably had something to do with that, <laughs> right? If you're looking for a perfect church, if you find it, don't go there because you'll mess it up. <laughs> you know, we're always looking for some corporate answer to the problems, but the problems are ours. Our families are what we create them to be. Our counties are what we allow them to be. Our cities are. It's all about us. So unless we're willing to take insight on ourselves, we don't have much of a chance to get better, do we? So we have selfish people. We have families that reflect on the selfishness of the people in them. And then those families go into churches and cultures and societies and the society becomes what the family is. So what do we do with that? I mean, in this message series, I've been trying to tell you, here's where we are, here's what that means, and where do we go from here? So how do Christians live in such a place where selfishness reigns and immorality increases? How can we be different kind of end times people in a broken world? Let's take a page from Benjamin Franklin. In his autobiography, Franklin described the darkness that filled the streets of Philadelphia during his day. It was pitch black at night, and people were sleeping on the streets, and they were stepping into mud puddles and stumbling over rough stones, and even worse, crime was growing. It wasn't safe to be out after sunset. So Franklin waged an intense campaign to persuade everyone to light the area around their own house. But he got nowhere. Finally, he just did it himself but only in front of his own house. He planted a pole in front of his porch with a kerosene light on top of the pole. That night in the city of Philadelphia, there was one house bathed in warm glow. The lamp cast light on the street, giving passerbys a feeling of well-being and safety. But the next night, another house had a lamp, and then another, and pretty soon, almost the whole city was lighting the walkways in front of their houses at night. Franklin learned something. He learned that our example is often greater than our words and our admonitions. And that's what we need to learn. With that in mind, I want to lift you out of 2 Timothy and take you to Ephesians 5. And this is the passage that says, For you were once darkness, 
but now you are light in the Lord. That sentence is short enough to memorize, but it's powerful enough to illumine the pathways around your life. First of all, you need to remember the grace that you received. How do we walk in the light when our society is defined by end times people? How do you be a Christian if you're surrounded by people who are doing the kinds of things we're watching right now, literally destroying the fabric of our country? Well, you have to experience God's grace through an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Metaphors involving light pervade Scripture. And Ephesians 5, 8 describes the difference that comes over us when we have grace with Christ. Before that moment, we live in darkness, as deep as underground caverns. We are spiritually, morally, personally, and eternally in pitch blackness. But the moment we come to Christ, he pushes down the lever that connects us to the throne of grace, and he switches on a billion megawatts of light inside of our souls. That experience is so vivid that many Christians describe their moment of grace in bright terms. Number two, reflect the light that you have become. That brings us to our next tactic for living in these dark times. We have to exude God's light. We have to convey it. We have to reflect it. We have to radiate it. That's what we read in Ephesians 5, 8. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Men and women, I am concerned about the way this present darkness is casting the shadow over many churches and over many Christians. Too many people in our community of faith are trying to blend the light and the darkness so they can kind of come up with a grayness in their life. And that doesn't work. It's a devilish lie to believe that we can be Christians without being different and distinct from the world. You can't. And you can't marry the world so that you'd be more acceptable to them. A lot of my younger friends who are pastors are doing that now with many of the social issues that we're facing in this country. As followers of Jesus, we have left the kingdom of darkness, and we are now children of light. So now we must walk, we must live as children of light. Finally, remember the grace you received, reflect the light you've become, and reveal the darkness that you see. The Ephesians passage goes on to tell us something else. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed and are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. John 20, 21 says, for everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. You and I are children of light. I don't want to be a negative person, offensive, making people uncomfortable, or drive people away. We can't help being lights in the darkness wherever we go, and it's going to be different for you. If you live for Christ, if you're not trying to be gray, if you're not trying to mesmerize your own self by marrying the darkness with the light, which doesn't work and is not acceptable and will just lead you wrong. If you're trying to really be the light, you just need to get excited about this. Someone isn't going to like you as much as they did before. But what I know is this, everybody in the world, whether they like to admit it or not, is looking for light. They're searching. They're trying to figure out why they are the way they are, why they do what they do. They're looking for someone to help them. And if you don't shine the light, if you compromise your witness, they won't come to you because they'll see the phoniness of who you are and what you're doing. That brings me back to Sean Hopwood, with whom we began. Remember him? He was going to prison at the age of 23. As time went by, he got a job in the prison library, and he began reading books about the law. And as he learned about the law, he began taking on cases for fellow prisoners, writing petitions they could use in federal courts. They called him the jailhouse lawyer. Sean also began corresponding with a friend named Annie, his secret crush through high school. Furthermore, his parents let him know they continued to pray for him, and his mom, she kept sending him Christian books. 
One day, Sean's prison friend, Robert, had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. Sean took all that in, and he found it increasingly difficult to rationalize his own darkened life. After Sean was released from prison in 2009, he and Annie were engaged, and they asked Pastor Marty Barnhart to officiate the wedding. But Barnhart wanted to talk to them first. He asked them what they believed about Jesus, and he said they could be forgiven by the shed blood of Christ. And the pastor's exact words were, yeah, even you, Sean, here's what happened next. The next day, I couldn't accept the feeling, said Sean, that God had been pursuing me for a long time, and that if I just abandoned my stubbornness and selfishness and hand everything over to him, I would find redemption. What does it mean to be redeemed, and how do you redeem yourself after robbing five banks? Well, the answer is you don't. The answer is that you need some help. In Ephesians 1, 7 through 8, Paul writes that in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. To put it differently, because of our sins, none of us, and surely no former prisoner like me, said Sean, can be redeemed on our own. We need the gospel of grace, which says that each of us matters and has worth because we're made in the image of God. Grace says we are not defined by our failures and our faults, but by a love without merit or condition. God's grace was enough to redeem me, he said. Sean and Annie asked Christ to come into their lives. They were married. They were baptized. They moved to Seattle so Sean could attend the University of Washington Law School and believe it or not, today, Sean is a professor of law at the Georgetown University in Washington, where he is spreading the light every day. We're living in a messed up world. Let's face it. The Bible warns that in the last days, perilous times will come. Society will go from bad to worse. But remember, the city of Ephesus was also a place of darkness in Paul's day, the city to which his letter was written. Yet Paul viewed the Christians there as children of light, their presence lit up the city streets with the glow of Jesus. So even in dark days, you can experience God's grace, exude his radiance, exhibit his holiness, and in a world increasingly dominated by the end times, God has empowered you to shine. And how many of you know, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Thank you for joining me today on Turning Point. The more we study scripture, the more we understand that our loving God desires to have a personal relationship with each one of us. If you would like to begin that relationship and ensure that you will spend eternity with Christ, you must simply repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. If you've taken this step of faith today, I encourage you to share your decision with other Christians at a trustworthy ministry or a local church and to continue growing in your faith. May God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Turning Point.